Welcome to NTA Nationwide. I am Jumai Yasov. The federal government has pledged its unwavering commitment to protecting the rights of journalists and ensuring their safety and security, as well as unfettered access to encourage the Nigerian media to grow in leaps and bounds. This is from the Minister of Information and National Orientation, Mohamed Idris, during a press briefing to commemorate the year 2024 World Press Freedom Day in Abuja. Details will come in our subsequent bulletin. And uh, to talk more about press freedom, we have our guest, who is um, Chris Kainde Nwodu, Executive Editor, CKN News. You're welcome to Nationwide. Thank you very much for having me. Good evening. Okay, let, let's talk about the theme for, for this year's um, uh, freedom, uh, Press Freedom Day. And it's about the, the environmental crisis and, you know, a press for the planet, journalism in the face of environmental crisis. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. Um, uh, good evening once again. Yes, um, the team of the noise on this prison by uh, And um, this year, uh, looking at the environment, and, uh, of climate change um, across the globe. If you've noticed what has been happening across the globe, the issue of flood, even Nigeria, um, the level of heat um, currently um, is uh, is so bad that um, everyone is feeling that uh, what is really happening. Then, if you, you've seen the effect of floods across the nation, across most of the states, and um, it has been that bad. Then you also look at the issue of the ozone layer. So the the team this year is focusing on mostly on climate change, which has been a, a, a fundamental issue across the globe. And uh, we feel that they feel that it's time for the media to focus attention on um, climate change and, and the environmental crisis, because if nothing is done, uh, then we are going to have issues. And that is why um, this year's team has, uh, is focusing on a press for the planet, journalism in the face of the environmental crisis. Okay, the, the day is also to celebrate the, you know, the fundamental principles of press freedom and to pay tributes to journalists who have lost their lives in the last line of duty. And we hear that in the past 14 years, you know, 44 environmental journalists have been killed in the last 15 years. And uh, in your own opinion, how is journalism practiced in Nigeria? Well, you know, uh, with all sense of humility, that uh, what we, we do, what we are doing, is more of a thankless job. Um, we are always the fourth child, uh, as when it comes. Everybody blames us. Politicians blame, blame us. Those in government blame us. If anything happens, oh no, it's journal journalists that misquoted us. But the fact remains that without journalism, then the, that is the side of the common man. That is how, how the, the, we are the voice of the voiceless. So, uh, but it's not only limited to Nigeria, across the globe. But just talking about um, just about 44 uh, journalists dying um, um, through environmental issues, crisis. But let me put a, a classical example. If you look at what is happening now in Gaza, the war between Israel, and um, and the Palestinians, over 140,000, uh, 140 journalists have been killed in the line of duty. That is unprecedented. Even during the um, um, the Second World War, until we lost that level of the number of journalists, so that shows you the hazard through journalists go through in trying to uh, be able to bring the news um, and information to the uh, average man on the street. So it is a very very hazardous job, even in Nigeria. Uh, we have been very, very lucky uh, that, um, unlike what used to happen during the uh, military era, we are now in a de democratic setting. So much of what happened in the past, if you remember vividly, there was a time that even a journalist's head was shaved 
by a military governor with bottle, broken bottle. That was what it used to be in the past. And we also happen. We also know what happened uh, during Decree Four uh, of 1985, where some journalists were also um, jailed. But that has improved. But that does not mean that it's um, a Dorado for journalists. We still run through some um, crisis getting to get information. You know that the Freedom of Information um, Bill was passed for us to be able to assess information in Nigeria. But till now. We cannot effectively use that because those within the authorities make it difficult for journalists to be able to assess news using the freedom of information uh, um, law or bill as it was. So it is um, it is not something cheery, but we believe that um, things can improve. We can we can be helped to do our job properly. Then those are just the basic. Also, then you look at uh, you, the, the pay for journalists. Journalists are some of the least paid. Uh, workers in Nigeria. Yes. That is a fact. I'm sure you know that. We are one of the least paid, but we do most of the job. So these are areas that generally we need to look at and God will need to improve upon. Okay, Mr. Chris, and, and, and I hope that government will look into the plight of journalists across the country and ensure a, a conducive working environment. And I'm going to take one of the quotes on, on press freedom there, and I would like you to give us yours too. May the press always be free and the truth never be a casualty. Let's have your quote as we sign you off. <laughs> you cannot keep the truth. The truth will always mean the truth, and the truth is always constant. That is what it is, and that is what we stand for as journalists. Okay, Mr. Chris, thank uh, Kind Wardo, Executive Editor, CKN News. Thank you for me coming on NTA Nationwide. It's been a thank pleasure. Thank you very much. It's nice to be here on the largest network in Africa. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much. Right. Well, the earlier report on the press freedom, uh, on the press conference by the Minister of Information and National Orientation, Mohammed Idris, during a press briefing to commemorate this year's 2024 World Press Freedom Day in Abuja is now ready. Let's take the report. Please state your name. The theme of this year's commemoration of the World Press Freedom Day is a press for the planet, journalism in the face of the environmental crisis. This is the reason for the presence of Ishako Salako, Minister of State Environment, joining the Minister of Information and National Orientation, Mohammed Idris. In line with the global campaign to save the environment, stakeholders and experts are looking inward and diversifying search for solutions. Journalists are therefore identified as the right people needed to join efforts to mitigate the menace of environmental challenges. Without a free and independent press, we cannot hope to address the complex environmental challenges that we face. Disinformation and misinformation undermine public understanding of environmental issues and hinder our ability to take meaningful action. Therefore, we must staunchly defend press freedom and support the work of journalists who are dedicated to reporting the truth. We are not paying attention to what's going on. We are not getting concerned about the logging in our forests. I come from a rainforest region. Uh, in the southwest, and I say when I go around, and I, I, I don't see the trees anymore. They've been locked, they've been cut off. And nobody's talking about how, how do we replace those trees. This was an opportunity for the Minister of Information and National Orientation to reiterate the federal government's commitment to promote and defend responsible journalism. You cannot tear your country apart just because you want to talk about press freedom. We have been talking about FDI's foreign direct investment into this country. You cannot have your newspapers and radio stations flashing about insecurity all the time, about things that are not palatable, and expect people from other clans to come and invest in this country. World Press Freedom Day is celebrated globally to, among others, highlight the pivotal role of the essential service providers in Abuja, Saliu Guanara, NTA News. Now, in line with his commitment to leverage gas to grow the economy, President Bola Tinibu is to inaugurate three critical gas infrastructure being undertaken by the Nigeria National Petroleum Company Limited and Partners. The project supports the federal government's effort to grow value from the nation's gas assets while eliminating gas flaring. 
The delivery of the project was accelerated from the inception of the administration in keeping with the overall objective of deepening domestic gas supply as a critical enabler for economic prosperity. The projects lined up for inauguration are AHL Gas Processing Plant 2, ANO Gas Processing Plant and ANO Dash OB3 CTM's gas pipeline project. When inaugurated, the project will increase gas supply to the domestic market, creating a better investment climate and promoting balanced economic growth. Now let me, let's return to the Press Freedom Reports as the National Orientation Agency is seeking the cooperation of the Nigerian media through the Broadcasting Organization of Nigeria, BURN, as a formidable ally in its efforts at sustaining productive engagement with Nigerians on the very important issues of values and national building. Topi Alabi reports that this was at a meeting in Abuja. In recognition of the vital role the media plays in today's world, this meeting between the Director General National Orientation Agency, Larry Issa Onilu, and the Broadcasting Organizations of Nigeria, born under the chairmanship of NTA's Director General, Salihu Abdul Hamid Dembos, seeks to mobilize Nigerians for positive attitudinal change necessary for the growth and development of the country. And for born, it is to move towards a new vista of reposition in the broadcast ecosystem for Noah's campaigns to implement federal government's comprehensive national value reorientation for a greater Nigeria. Basically, I think what we are out to achieve is to see how we can make Nigeria a better place for all Nigerians. And uh, we all have a responsibility to that. And uh, we are fully prepared to give the NOA the supporting uh, uh, hand to make sure that we bring the desired change in this country. So this is what we are out to achieve and um, all hands we are going to be on deck. Because this is a Nigerian project, and so everybody is involved. We all must uh, play our own role in it. Um, well, NOA has been charged with the responsibility, you know, by law, to spearhead this, but we cannot do it alone. We had a very fruitful discussion on how to ensure that we all collaborate so that our messages can get to the last man in this country and we're able to mobilize Nigerians for peace, for progress and for the stability of this country. Since its establishment in 1973, bond membership has increased to more than 100 and its vision is to foster a future-proof environment for radio, TV and new media broadcasters to serve their audiences and contribute meaningfully to national development. In Abuja, Tokwe Alabi, NTA News. And efforts by the federal government to promote made in Nigerian products, brands, goods and services will soon yield the desired results. Secretary to the government of the Federation, George Akume, represented by the Permanent Secretary Cabinet Office, expressed the optimism of the opening of stakeholders' meeting on Buy Made in Nigeria Expo. Kenneth Nani reports. Buy Made in Nigeria, Expo, Exhibition and Economic Forum is a federal government's program designed to project Nigeria made products, brands, goods and services as well as foster economic cooperation and business development globally. It will also build long-term sustainable business and trade relationships that will broaden our investment horizons. Now, the oil and gas and housing sectors are being pushed to the front banner to lead conversations around rebranding of made in Nigerian products and in building business opportunities to boost direct foreign investments that will propel a national economic growth. Gas is going to be a major export, a major product of Nigeria. And uh, we need to showcase that, that potential. We have a gas master plan, but it takes tremendous amount of investment to build the gas distribution infrastructure. We have a lot of our people in the diaspora who have already um, improved their life and want to bring something back home. So one of the things we also want to do is to encourage them to come back and invest, not just investing in their housing, but also investing in the real estate sector. To achieve the set goal of the exhibition schedule to take place this year in various countries around the world, emphasis is on local content development, standardization, branding, 
and packaging of finished products as well as export of goods and services that will compete favorably in the global market. Kenneth Nanim, NTN News. In a bid to boost its economy, Enugu state government has moved to revamp state-owned maribond industries with an award of contract for the resuscitation of its five-star hotel, presidential and Niger Gas Company. Chiaganu Ano reports that its hope come alive for residents as commendations thrill the initiative. Hotel Presidential was built in 1963 by the then Premier of the Eastern Region, Dr. Michael Obara. It was an income generating outlet as well as a tourist attraction. It stood like a colossus at the heart of the cold city. But the fortunes of the hotel dwindled after subsequent administrations left it in decay. I, I remember passing through Nikelik. I, well, I don't talk about the presidential because the relic of what we have is just an, a relic of what used to be called hotel presidential. It's no longer hotel presidential until it is rebuilt. So we are happy that the governor uh, awarded the contract to renovate the hotel. So we believe it's going to go a long way. In the first place, it will create jobs for our people. Recently, the Enugu State Government awarded contract to revamp the hotel presidential and Niger Gas Company, among other maribond industries in the state. This move, residents say, is highly commendable. In Enugu, Chiegono Aro, NTA News. And Chiegono Aro is standing by at the hotel presidential to tell us more. Chiegono, I can see that the hotel is still in Kaka stage. Tell us what will happen when it is finally completed. Thank you so much and welcome to Enugu. This is the hotel presidential premises. Before now, the hotel uh, presidential was the hub of activities in the entire southeast before it was neglected and brought down to its knees. It was the pride of the southeast. With about 431 suites, presidential suites, governor suites, executive suites, and you name it. But it's now it's a ghost of itself. He had also a beautiful swimming, a world-class swimming pool, which is uh, left like uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a desert oasis. The location of the hotel presidential really has a lot to do with uh, the tourism sector and the hospitality industry because it towers above all other buildings. It's a five-star hotel towering at the heart of the cold city. When it is revamped, we are sure, it's going to be a, 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 a greater way of uh, helping in making money for the state. The IGR will be increased, employment opportunities will be created, tourism will be enhanced, hospitality industry will be improved. A lot of advantages and that is why the residents of Enugu are applauding the, the, the laudable projects by the governor, Pitamba, who wants to make Enugu the destination of tourism in the southeast. He wants Enugu to take the pride of place as the headquarters of the southeast. And the, 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 the hotel presidential should stand to, 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 to contend with its counterpart at the Port Harcourt. It's a lot, a lot of dilapidation. But we are just, the, the prayer on the, in, on the lips of everybody is to let this will of the governor come to fruition. Let what he has said come to be. And may his efforts really come and to be realized that the people of Enugu may breathe another breath of fresh air. Yes, indeed, Chiagonu, and uh, I can see that it will bring a lot of developmental, you know, um, project, I mean, development to your state and um, create a lot of job opportunities for the citizens of Enugu. Thank you so much for your contribution to Nationwide today. Moving on, the Federal Ministry of Education is set to carry out a national census of schools and teachers as well as headcount of students in primary and secondary schools across the country. 
Minister of Education, Professor Tahir Maman, who disclosed this during a courtesy call on Nigeria's First Lady, says the census scheduled to begin this month is part of ongoing efforts to promote functional education in the country. State House correspondent Adeni Taiwo has more. The desire to promote functional education and drive inclusion in the sector, particularly in the area of addressing out-of-school children, is a shared concern for the Ministry of Education and Nigeria's First Lady, Uluya Mitinumbu, whose recent interventions are already impacting the educational landscape. We have monitored um, your activity. It is therefore not surprising that this visit to our office by the Education Minister and his team started on a note of appreciation with the Minister acknowledging our crucial interventions in the sector. Quality education at the basic level is the major focus of the ministry, and the first step in that direction is to get accurate data for planning. It's not just knowing their number, but those of them who are struggling, who are not in school. If somebody, if a child is not in school, why? You know, so that the government can intervene efficiently, and hopefully by the end of this year we plan to conclude on that. The minister says the number of children who proceed to secondary schools from primary schools range from between 20 to 25 percent. So, while the government is keen on establishing a database for the country, it is also working on introducing skills acquisition programs at that level. So that by the time they finish primary school and even junior secondary school, they will have some tangible skills they can go out and do. Because I'm still teaching, I just believe I have In the first lady, the work. minister found a willing partner as she made a case for priority funding of the sector in order to meet up with emerging trends in technology. Why can't we go back to the technical colleges and, you know, you put a lot of resources there? Because after primary school or high school, we make provision for that. They can go straight to um, technical colleges and they can get their diplomas. Calling for incentives to attract learners, the first lady also made a case for adult literacy programs and the rejigging of the school feeding program. And also re introduce cafeteria where they can buy food and government can supplement. The, we, we can do a lot of innovation when it gets to that. Food can attract children to go to school. To further push the interest of Nigerians in taking up courses in the sector, the minister presented 1,000 slots of scholarship for education programs and another 100 in general courses to the Renewed Hope Initiative. In the State House, Adeni Itaiwo, NT News. Meanwhile, the Universal Basic Education Commission, UBEC, says it is partnering with stakeholders in the education sector to implement a skill acquisition program called School to Work Scheme for young learners in junior or secondary schools. This was at a meeting of commissioners for education from the 36 states and FCT and all the critical stakeholders in Abuja. In 2018, the National Council on Education, NCE, approved and mandated the Universal Basic Education Commission to design and implement skill acquisition program called School to Work Scheme for junior secondary schools for the period of six months. This is to enable learners to dictate early in life where their talents and potentials lie with the aim of equipping them with lifelong skill and entrepreneurship for self-reliance. The scheme is structured to provide, as had already again been indicated, at least six months training broken into two months per year of study in the junior secondary school. This scheme includes internship, career counseling, skill acquisition, competitive education, job placement, and of recent ICT. This is set to give them an option, the STWS program will enhance their chance to shine. By the time you offer skills to these teenagers, you have done so many things by reducing the level of unemployment. It is expected that generations of school leavers who are productive, self-employed and contributing to economic well-being of the country will emerge. 
In the meantime, the National Senior Secondary Schools Commission is advocating the establishment of a secondary schools board in Katsina State to oversee the management and development of secondary school in the, in the state. The Executive Secretary of the Commission, Dr. Iyala Ajayi, made the call during an interactive session with the officials of the State Ministry of Education. Awal Haliru has the report. The move is aimed at improving the quality of education and ensuring that students have access to modern facilities and infrastructure. The Commission has also selected Musawa Science Secondary School in the state to be among the 50 schools across the country to receive infrastructure and facility upgrades. I know that you know, there are problems when it comes to the establishment of boards, but we are trying to find a way you know, around it to see how every stakeholder, the, the stakeholder will be involved in the running of the senior secondary education board. If we do not have the right school environment, the right infrastructure, I don't think um, the teachers and the children would be in the right frame of mind to come to school. So yes, infrastructure is a huge thing. There's a lot of dilapidation. Um, so we're making sure, and then we are trying to see how we can decongest the classes. The upgrade will include the construction of modern classrooms, laboratories and libraries, as well as provision of digital learning tools and equipment. Awal Haluru, NTA News. Time now to join Adiola Kamiakere in Lagos for more on Nationwide. Hello, Adiola. It's good to see you. Good to see you. We'll begin with the World Press Freedom Day. Journalists in Nigeria are conversing for maximum protection against hostility attacks and threats to life meted out on practitioners, especially from members of the public and sometimes major actors in the state who sometimes are perceived docile in the face of opposing forces against freedom of press. Amaka Owo reports. Nigeria is ranked 120 out of 180 countries, according to the World Press Freedom Index. In the year 2021 alone, the International Press Center recorded 41 incidents of attacks on journalists and media professionals, with 57 of them affected, varying from unlawful arrests, detention, assaults, threat to life, and in some instances, death. These challenges hinder the freedom of the press, which is meant to be the bedrock of a progressive society. So we cannot separate press freedom from development because the, the press needs to be free enough, independent enough to air the view of the society, beam such light on what government is doing and create the bridge between the electorate and the leaders. This video is a minor reflection of what men of the fourth estate of the realm face in the cause of carrying out their duty. It's the government that should lay down the marker to say we are a democracy, we will let journalists operate with unfettered, unfettered restriction. This year's theme is focusing on press for the planets, journalism in the face of environmental crisis. Focus on the environment is very apt for uh, sub-Saharan Africa, for Nigeria particularly, and for developing nations as the case may be. You use the journalist to stabilize, to get information about everything that has to do with governance. So you should also find a way of ensuring that they are taking care of most especially their welfare. The World Press Freedom Day goes beyond beaming such light and curbing persecution of journalists, promoting press freedom to celebrating the bravery of journalists. In Lagos, Amaka O, NCE News. And following the demolition of makeshift rooms illegally constructed under the Dolphin Estate Bridge in Ekoi by the Lagos State Ministry of Environment, the State Building Control Agency has warned that conversion of public space to makeshift accommodation and other actions that constitute a threat to the environment and security of a state will not be allowed to rear its ugly head again in any part of a state. Joel Kukwola reports that some of the legal occupants are still evacuating their belongings. 
No one will ever imagine that there are people who will pay to reside under the bridge in Lagos. Incredible as it sounds, this makeshift structure pulled down by the Lagos State Ministry of Environment comprised of 86 partitioned rooms with quarters paying as much as 250000 per year to live here. This discovery has sparked curiosity with many wondering who could have authorized the occupants to live under the bridge in a highbrow area like Ikoyi, oblivious of the consequences of their actions, which could expose critical public infrastructure to risk of damage. Days after the demolition, some of the occupants are yet to pack their belongings, which remains of the makeshift structure still noticeable under the bridge and surrounding areas. Some of the occupants who agreed to speak on camera blamed their actions on the high cost of rent in Lagos. Because once it's closer to their business place or their working place and it means for transport. So they see that an advantage for them to be closer to their working place. That's in life, you have to understand that you must, as long as you are living, you must face challenges. The Lagos State Waste Management Authority are also on ground to ensure that the area is completely cleaned of the debris. It is a rainy day today in Ikoyi, Lagos, and I am here to see the situation. And the big question is, why would someone pay 250,000 Naira just to sleep under the bridge? Reacting to the incident, the Lagos State Building Control Agency say stringent punitive measures will be taken against those who abuse public infrastructure in the state. See, this thing is not all about government. It's about you and I. Somebody is building bad in your, in your neighborhood and you kept quiet. Is it the GM that is in Ikeja that will come to Ireland and supervise? The first point of call, the first responders are the people that are living nearby. For now, the tentacles of security agencies are more active to unravel such hideouts in the states. In Lagos, Joel Bukbola, NC News. Really mind-boggling there. Well, those are the reports from Lagos. Nationwide will continue with Jumei in Abuja after this time out. Please stay with us. Thanks for joining us. The federal government, through the National Emergency Management Agency, has delivered tons of assorted grains to Yobe State for distribution to vulnerable and indigenous citizens to cushion their hardship. The grains were released from the National Strategic Grain Reserve in compliance with Presidential Directive. Yunusa Suleiman tells us more. These are part of the 42,000 metric tons of grains pledged to states by President Bola Ahmed Tinubu to lessen the current economic hardship and boost national food security. The grains were released from the National Strategic Grain Reserve, with Yobe State having 21,000. 114 50 kg bags of assorted grains consisting of maize, millet, and sorghum for distribution to its vulnerable population. The food items will be shared equally to all the local governments in the state. Also, based on the directive of the president, 20% of the food items due to the each local government should be given to religious groups, Jeremiah and Khan, and 3% to be given to boarding schools in the local government areas. Governor Bunihu commended President Bola Ahmed Tinubu for complementing the efforts of the state government with the grains as palliative, also flags of the distribution of the commodities to some deserving beneficiaries. I wish to assure you that government will continue to ensure fair and equitable distribution of these grains to people who are in genuine need and not to persons who will send it out at a giveaway rate to some Sherlock merchants to be resold to the people at very high prices. 126,000 beneficiaries from the 17 local government areas of the state are expected to benefit from the gesture. In the matter, Yenusa Suleiman, NTN. About 300 present farmers have received agricultural input under the Kaduna State COVID-19 Action Recovery and Economic Stimulus to empower farmers to cultivate more lands in this year's farming season. The package is designed to enhance food security among rural dwellers. Mohamed Umar Anjiki reports. 
farmers in Kaduna State are gearing up for this year's farming season. The government on its part is coming up with various packages to support them to ensure massive production to enhance food security. The distribution of agricultural inputs for poor and vulnerable farmers in Kechi and Igabi local government areas under the COVID-19 recovery and economic stimulus by the Kaduna State government in collaboration with NGK is to cushion the effect of economic crunch and provide access to farmers. Madaki Adua Johanna and Eunice Kletus are beneficiaries of this gesture, which they said will stimulate them and others in their community to cultivate large hectares of land during this rainy season. This year we can farm a lot of uh, pieces of land because this thing will come to our aid. We help us very well. So we, see, we really appreciate it. Before we used to farm, so we farm ginger. There is no ginger now. So I pray this thing that this machine that they give me will help me this year. It's not because of this aid that we are able to receive today. We couldn't have farmed. Because if you go to the shop of fertilizers now, a, fertilizer, a bag of fertilizer is more than 40,000. And by this just so, shown by the executive governor of Kaduna said, at least we appreciate it. Kaduna State Commissioner for Agriculture and Rural Development, Muhammad Mutala Dabu, said the state government rolled out incentives to support peasant farmers. It's meant to improve their productivity, improve their capacity. Someone that used to cultivate a hectare with the tiller, he can do three or four or five, even five. That way it will scale up the productivity and then food security will be ensured. The exercise will be conducted in Igabi local government area for other beneficiaries. In Kaduna, I am Muhammad Muradingi, NTA News. Now, the current weather status in Bauchi State of 40 to 45 degrees Celsius has become a source of concern to many people. The situation is characterized by excessive heat and the medical experts say it requires adequate measures for the prevention of diseases associated with the weather. Let's listen to Zainab Agwala as she tells us more on the situation. Adverse effect of the extreme weather condition experienced in Baltic State is now a serious challenge to the well-being of the inhabitants. Bacteria causing various ailments are, however, bound to grow faster than normal as a result of this harsh weather condition. Therefore, transmission of malaria, deadly as it is, we see things like pneumonia coming in, caused by bacteria. The mosquitoes, the same thing. They hatch better during the more moist or other humid hot weathers. Proper dieting is categorized as a strong measure of reducing the effect of the ailments that are in many cases leading to the loss of lives. If you have to have this diabetes, you have to control it. Carbohydrate. But once you don't have you don't have diabetes, you can the only thing you can take any of the carbohydrates, but you make sure you don't take junk food, then take water, drink more water. The medical experts also draw the attention of people on the need to always have a sound sleep and avoid eating food with high caffeine in order to remain healthy. Zainab Abola, NTN News. And now we're now joining Zena Agbola live and on the situation of the harsh weather in that uh, zone. Uh, Zena, having lived in the northeast myself for, for all my life, I, I, I know how it feels when the weather is like this. Tell us, how is it over there? We've had rains in Abuja and we hear there have been rains in other parts of the country. Have you had your first rain yet? Thank you, studio. The weather situation here in Bauchi, the Bauchi state has been extremely hot these days, leading to a report on the increase in the death record. The hospitals are now witnessing high number of people with various health challenges, especially that of high blood pressure. Here with me is Dr. Muhammad Dauda, a consultant family physician at Abuka Tafabliwa University Teaching Hospital, Bauchi. Nice to have you. Doctor. Yes. Uh, actually, uh, we have witnessed such things in various clinics, uh, especially in the clinic I had, that is a geriatric clinic, 
where we take care of the elderly. Even in the last clinic, I received report of death of about four of my patients that we are not able to come for follow-up. However, as we are yet to conduct autopsy to be able to ascertain the actual cause of death. But sincerely, I can assure you it may not be all related to the weather condition because the elderly patients are most are some of the patients that are vulnerable and they are affected most by the weather condition because they are they are usually vulnerable they cannot calculate the body temperature as well likewise the actual organ that control tests usually uh, malfunctions from the age of 50 thereby sometimes they may be testy but they may not be able to sense that they are testy so this may lead to dehydration and it can bring about some, a lot of morbidities and mortality. However, there is an unconfirmed, we are yet to have an official confirmation of this uh, incident, sincerely. Okay, what are the precautions measures against the tissue? Yes, the precautionary measures, number one, is adequate rehydration. Because if you look at the weather now, it's in Bauchi, it ranges between 38 to 42, 40, even up to 43 degrees at some part of Bauchi, like Azari, where the weather is extremely hot. So one of the precautionary measures is rehydration. One should be taking fluid adequately. Then the second thing is one should be taking shed, especially those that are working at the outdoors, the laborers, they should try as much as possible to be having shed so that they can be able to reduce the heat exposure. And once one is exposed to heat, one should try to cool himself, maybe by fanning, having places where there can be aces so that one can cool himself. And once such things happen, because it has a spectrum, it can range from heat cramps, heat exhaustion, and even heat stroke. In the case of heat cramps, it usually occurs in those that are working, uh, maybe marathon runners, those that are working at, at the outlet uh, positions, maybe the laborers that, are, that in heavy manual work, which is usually outside the sun. They tend to sweat a lot, losing the sodium, which is, which is responsible for adequate muscle contraction. Thereby, they may present with nausea, vomiting, and even having cramps or pains on their legs as well as at the abdominal muscles. So in this case, once we are able to have patients like that, we isolate them and prevent them from having such heat. We rehydrate them, we fan them, we cool them, and usually within 24 hours, they go back to their normal status of health. Then the second spectrum is the heat exhaustion, where the patient comes with nausea, vomiting, dehydration, and even confusion in such a way that the patient may not even may not be able to take the right decision at the right time, even though the patient might have been previously a very intelligent uh, person in the society. So in that case, once we have that, we usually uh, take care of the patients this may require admission because we may have to give intravenous fluid for the patient to come back to states of uh, normal health then the extreme of it is what is called heat stroke this in this case it can come with convulsion and even loss of consciousness the patient may not, may come on uh, in an unconscious state and in this case it has a very high mortality uh, incident, as high as 10% of those that have that developed heat stroke, about 10% of them can easily die if, proper, if they are not handled properly. So, Zainab Agbola there with a situation report on the harsh weather situation in Bauchi. I will apologize for the poor audio there due to the windy situation in Bauchi State. The news continues as federal government says it is building resilient power sector with personnel, personnel equipped with required skills for electrical installations and turnaround maintenance to ensure standardization and safety in the sector. Joshua Ojito reports that the National Power Training Institute of Nigeria, which is driving the initiative, is also partnering National Board for Technical Education to bridge the gap between academic qualification and skills in line with Nigeria's skills development policy. But this opportunity creates, you know, that very uh, uh, opportunity for us, you know, to be able to really run fast and provide critical mass, you know, medium for us to be able to assess, you know, the skills in development 
in Nigeria. All what you have in the power sector is operation and maintenance of equipment, which are largely skilled in you know, oriented. So all those who work within the power sector, they need to be skilled up before they can be allowed to even go on the line. Today, globally, the world economy is driven by skills. Nigerian youth must be properly certified. Those who are to do the certification, assessment for the certification, are the quality assurance assessors. And we hope all stakeholders will now promote it so that Nigeria can turn around the potentials in our youth and convert them into a latent force for the national economy. Nigeria, to grow economically, we have to do everything 100% Nigerian. Meanwhile, two more mobile substations acquired under the federal government's Siemens deal have been energized in Lagos and Burning Kempi to boost power transmission. Minister of Power Adebayo Adelabo, who inaugurates the mobile substation, says the infrastructure stands as beacon of hope for businesses and households towards achieving uninterrupted power supply. The two substations installed have total wheeling capacity of 123 megawatts, which is expected to enhance electricity supply. Minister of Power Adebayo Adelabo describes the project as a testament to the renewed hope agenda of President Bola Chinibu in accelerating the delivery of Siemens project, thereby transforming the power sector. The minister implores Nigerians to safeguard the infrastructure as success of government interventions in the sector hinges on collective responsibility. It's now time to join Kemi Oshin in Nibadong for more on Nationwide. Hello, Kemi. Hello, Jumai, and a warm welcome to Ibadan. Federal government remains resolute in its commitment to the global target of ending HIV AIDS by 2030 and providing support for people living with the disease in the country. This was made known by the newly appointed Director General, National Agency for Control of AIDS, NACA, Dr. Timitokwe Ilori, during a three day facts finding visit to all your states. Here is the report. HIV AIDS remain a major public health concern in Nigeria, despite growing commitments by the federal government to end the scourge. The Director General, National Agency for the Control of AIDS, NACA, therefore set out on a fact-finding mission to assess the current framework and possible areas of challenges at primary secondary and tertiary health facilities, beginning with Oyo State, which has been identified as one of those leading in state ownership of HIV programs in the country. To preach it in the church, say it in the mosque, that anybody that has the disease, they should on their home be able to take responsibility of their health. We are looking forward to what we call sustainability agenda, where in Nigeria we take ownership of all the processes involved, and we believe that before 2030, HIV will no longer be a public health threat. Faith Olawale, who says he has been living with HIV for over 30 years, noted that death tolls are declining with expansion in access to antiretroviral therapy, but more needs to be done to empower people living with the virus. With that drug, if I take that drug and I don't feel well, it will, it will go contrary. For those that did not disclose to their partner, it was a challenge for them. For me, that time, I didn't have any challenges because my husband support me. The exercise, according to NACA, reveals that prevention of mother-to-child transmission and access to HIV test kits are areas of focus as Nigeria continues its health and non-health response to HIV AIDS. Stakeholders have been encouraged to complement government's efforts on routine immunization of children, women, and girls, which is believed to have remained suboptimal and fluctuating over the years. This was at a one day regional immunization workshop for pediatricians. Omoka and Barry was at the event held in Ibado. Her report is here presented. The workshop, which brought together medical experts and health educators across the southwest region and Quara states deliberated on child immunization and the need to eradicate cervical cancer in women and girls. It's meant to prevent cervical cancer and also penile cancer. Public 
awareness, acceptability of vaccines, monitoring and evaluation of immunization program have been described as roles of pediatricians in their respective localities as Dr. Temito Payani spoke on reducing cervical cancer burden, making a case for human papilloma virus vaccine, HPV, for girls between the ages of 9 and 14, with single dose strategies. Immunization helps to prevent or drastically reduce the occurrence of vaccine preventable diseases in our population. The participants have been uh, empowered and they will be able to promote vaccination effectively. To get vaccinated so that the rate at which people are coming down with cervical cancer can be reduced even in our country. The regional immunization workshop called on relevant stakeholders, religious leaders and community heads to continue to advocate for routine immunization for women, girls and other children against unforeseen diseases, especially cervical cancer and all other ailments. And that's it from Ibado. It's back to Jume in Abuja for more on Nationwide. Thank you, Kemi. The Social Democratic Party, SDP, has expressed confidence in the leadership of President Bola Tinibu's administration to bring Nigeria out of the current socio-economic challenges. Kenneth Nanim reports that the leadership of the party is also urging the federal government to review some of its economic policies to better the livelihood of citizens. Fuel subsidy removal and the recent increase in electricity tariff are two major decisions by the federal government that may lend credence to the saying that to make an omelette, you may need to break some eggs. Of course, decisions often leave scars. However, the Social Democratic Party believes that there must be a cushion after a big jump in policies. The party identified the resuscitation of small-scale businesses and manpower development energized by a reliable and rapidly growing power sector across the country as one of such policy trusts. We don't want the president to fail. We don't want the country to go into anarchy. And what we can do as a party, as an institution, is to collaborate, advise the president to do the needed. Most of us have confidence in him. We saw what he, what he did when he was the governor of Lagos. The party, however, commended President Tinubu's administration in his efforts to contain insecurity across the country. Security situation is improving uh, very well. Most of the ringleaders are out of circulation. And of course, even in the southeast where they sit at home, it has drastically reduced. Meanwhile, some members of the party from Nasarawa State Assembly express confidence in the leadership style of the national chairman of the SDP, which they believe has brought the party to an enviable height. Kenneth Nanim, NTA News. And that's it on NTA Nationwide. Thanks so much for your time. On behalf of the crew, it's been a pleasure. I am Jumma Yusuf.